Our speakers today are Dr. Jonas Korlock and Dr. Sarah Kingen from Pacific Biosciences. Um, they've been most gracious to volunteer to be our first speakers and help us work through all the tricky logistics of hosting this live webinar. Um, and for that, I sincerely thank them. And so with that, I'll hand the presentation over to Jonas. Thank you so much, Anna, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present uh, to you today. So I would like to give a, a brief introduction um, about PEC biosequencing, and then Sarah will uh, give a detailed uh, description of the PEC bio workflow and one example of a recent project that was done um, on insect genome sequencing. So to this audience, I probably don't have to uh, stress the um, the importance of or the difference between draft and gapless genomes. Um, I thought this is just one paper that I, I really like. Um, seven reasons to close fragmented genome assemblies, and uh, the authors here highlight All very nicely that. participants are now in listen-only mode. That with gapless genomes, of course. Um, it's much easier to do things like characterize structural rearrangements, uh, characterize repetitive element catalogs, identify clusters of co-regulated genes, map uh, better epigenetic marks and identifying them. And so this is highlighted in this figure. And I think the author summarized it very nicely that a gapless genome assembly provides significant advantages to unravel the complexity of an organism's biology. So it's, it's not about really contig N50s and scaffold N50s. What matters in the end is what you can do with that genome and, and what you understand with regard to the um, uh, biology. And so there are, there are three things that you need for um, generating a high quality genome in terms of the uh, sequencing technologies. You need long sequence reads, that's important because, and long continuous sequence reads uh, because you want to resolve repetitive elements in the genome and the long reads and provide the contiguity in the genome assembly. Long reads are not enough. There are two other things that are really important. Um, the second one is uniformity in sequencing quality and coverage relative to, um, the, um, relative to the GC content or the sequence complexity of the DNA. Um, and that allows you then to sequence the entire genome um, and not just the portions of the genome that are enabled by a particular sequencing technology. And then lastly, of course, uh, system, um, accuracy is important. So uh, you can't have systematic sequencing errors because they will pile up and not be washed out in consensus. And so random errors are fine, actually, because they will wash out as you build the final consensus and then uh, give you accurate genome sequencing. And so um, I would say that the short-read sequencing systems are, are quite good in the third one, but they're not that good in the uh, first two with regard to um, the shorter read lengths and also the bias that these uh, short read technologies have with regard to extreme DNA sequence context. And so PEC biosequencing was aimed to uh, excel in all three of those areas. Um, you are probably familiar that um, we have uh, the longest reads um, um, in the longest continu continuous reads in the industry that are now averaging over 10,000 bases. It's been uh, well described in the literature that um, PEC biosequencing has the least bias of any technology, being able to sequence even the most extreme sequence context, and it has a high consensus accuracy. The individual read error rate is higher, but what's important is that these errors are random, so they wash out and you get a very high quality uh, consensus. So for those of you who don't know, very briefly, um, single molecule real-time sequencing or smart sequencing works by uh, observing the real-time dynamics of DNA polymerase molecules, individual molecules. I understand the video is going to be a bit choppy, but hopefully you get the idea. And this is uh, the um, activity is followed in real time using fluorescently tagged nucleotides that have different colors. And as those are being processed by the polymerase, we read off the uh, type of base that was uh, incorporated. This is done in a highly parallel fashion. On the upper right, you see an array of um, uh, sequencing sites and the flickering colors, the spots um, are emanating signals from the polymeric molecules there. From each of those dots, the information is extracted in time to then give rise to a, a long sequence read, and that's then being converted into the FAST2 and FASTA files that you're familiar with. We have two instruments. This was our first instrument, the, the PECBIO RS2. And then about a year ago, we introduced uh, the SQL system, which uh, it, the underlying technology is the same, but it provides higher throughput. 
And so with these very different um, characteristics from Illumina sequencing or even Sanger sequencing, we have seen a very uh, rapid, um, uh, really an explosion of publications. There are now uh, approximately 1,700 publications and you see how uh, this has um, uh, evolved over time. Um, so right now there's about 25 to 30 papers per week uh, that come out in all the different areas um, that sequencing is used. And with regard to um, high quality packed biogenome assemblies, this has been described and utilized for all walks of life. This tree is not to be meant to be phylogenetically accurate, um, but you can see that um, over all um, uh, different organisms, plants, animals, uh, it has been uh, described and there's now on Twitter a, a, a hashtag, the one megabase contact club for these uh, highly contiguous high quality genomes. I just want to give one example in the non-insect space very briefly. This was uh, the cover of Science a few months ago um, on um, the pack bioassembly of the gorilla genome. And uh, just to highlight that, you know, nowadays it's, it's hard to get covers of, of um, magazines like Science or Nature on genome projects. And this one had already been sequenced. And so the reason I think why um, the cover was warranted because it um, provided such a dramatic improvement over the previous short read based assemblies. It had over 150 fold greater contiguity, closed over 90% of the previous gaps, added uh, 150 megabases of new sequence, uh, corrected errors. Um, there was a lot of new discoveries, over 85% of the structure of genetic variation was new and corrected previous estimates. So uh, it's not an incremental improvement in many cases, it's really a quite a dramatic improvement. And there were some nice figures uh, in uh, conjunction with the paper. And in the paper, this was the new assembly um, graphically showing the contiguity con compared to the short read assembly of the previous uh, reference. Here in the paper is an example of the contig lengths uh, that were done with Illumina or the Sanger sequencing and then with PEC biosequencing. And this is a log plot. So this is a thousand times difference um, from, from here to there. Now with regard to uh, PEC bio publications in the area of insect research, there have been quite a number and I know this is being recorded so you can stop the YouTube video if you're um, interested in looking through this list uh, comprehensively. Those are also all available on our website. Uh, we have a publications resource archive. And these are all uh, in all different areas, not just assembly, but also uh, the pathogens of uh, insects, the microbiome of insects, and, and various aspects of targeted sequencing. And so just uh, one example is uh, in terms of um, genome assemblies is from Drosophila. Now I realize that Drosophila melanogaster is not uh, the, the, the prototypical type of insect or type of sample that you will have um, in most cases because it's inbred and heavily studied and so forth. But I do want to point out that um, the assembly was better than the current reference and had some of the chromosome arms resolved as complete contacts from the centromere, uh, from the centromere to the telomere. And it's still persistent gaps and spurred quite a number of papers now that uh, revealed uh, new insights, new biological insights in certain regions that were resolved for the very first time, finding new genes on the Y chromosomes, um, characterizing the uh, transposon landscape, uh, repetitive elements, and other genes. And there are some others um, from Amanda uh, Laracuente's lab on the bioarchives that have not yet been published. So uh, even in such a well-studied organism like Drosophila, there are new insights and new learning from these high-quality PEC bioassemblies. So um, that's what I wanted to uh, say for the introduction. And now I will hand it over to Sarah, who's going to talk in more detail about how um, the workflow is done and then give an example, a specific example of a recent project that we did in sequencing and a high quality assessment. Go ahead, Sarah. Unmute and, and take it. Okay. Away. Great. I'm just getting my screen set up, so bear with me. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Looks great. Okay. Great. Thank you, Jonas, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Sarah Kingen, and I am a senior um, bioinformatics scientist at PacBio, and I work in the applications group. Um, prior to working at PacBio, I actually worked in um, Jack Warren's lab at the University of Rochester, where I had some involvement with the I5K project, um, screening some of the insect genomes for bacterial contamination, as well as looking, um, looking for evidence of lateral gene transfer 
from bacteria into the insect assemblies. Um, so as Jonas said, I'm going to um, delve a little bit deeper into the science of the PAC bioassembly for insect genomes. Um, I'm first going to give you a practical overview of the PacBio workflow from sample prep through sequencing and genome assembly. And then I'm going to shift to focus on a recent genome assembly of the yellow fever mosquito Aedes aegypti, which is a great example of the power of PacBio sequences for insect genomics. Okay. So the PacBio workflow is both simple and scalable and can be used for a variety of applications from targeted ampliconic sequencing to transcript analysis to, in the case that we're going to talk about today, large genome assembly. The major steps of the workflow are familiar and proceed from library construction through primer annealing and polymerase binding to loading and running on the sequencing instrument. And as Jonas said, we currently have two machines, the RS2 and the SQL machine. The analysis um, can be broken into two different stages, first the primary analysis and secondary analysis, where primary analysis is simply the conversion of the images of the sequencing reaction to more familiar um, files in terms of uh, reads, so bases and their associated qualities. Secondary analysis can be thought of any work done with the read data itself, which could be mapping uh, reads to a reference genome or doing a de novo assembly. So with, um, for sequencing large genomes, the quality of the starting DNA is key. In order to get very long reads, up to 60 KB or more, you need to have high quality, high molecular weight DNA to start. High molecular weight DNA can be sheared with a variety of methods from commercially available systems like Megaruptor shown here, including a degraded sample in lane five. Um, and you can also shear with more kind of old school or less expensive methods, such as needle shearing. Um, for a large insert library of about 20 KB, you typically need 10 micrograms of starting DNA, um, but you can run multiple cells, multiple sequencing cells for that library. The library preparation proceeds using um, standard molecular biology techniques, from DNA fragmentation, as discussed in the previous slide, to DNA damage repair and repair, adapter ligation, and template purification. The whole process takes as little as three to four hours, with some steps being allowed to sit overnight or incubate overnight for convenience. Again, size selection is key for large genome sequencing. Um, we typically recommend using Blue Pippin or ELF from Sage Science for size selection of 20 to 30 KB libraries. This process removes smaller library fragments and increases the abundance of the longest reads in your data set. After size selection of the library, primers are annealed to adapters, and then the polymerase is bound to the template molecules. At this point, the Smart Bell templates are loaded onto the sequencing machine, and these um, Templates are tethered to the bottom of sequencing wells so that the um, sequencing reaction can be observed in real time. So we have two um, different sequencing machines currently. Um, the PacBio RS2 was launched in 2013, and the SQL machine was launched last year. Um, SQL has uh, seven times as many um, sequencing wells per chip and has correspondingly higher outputs. Um, the input DNA per cell and the read lengths and read qualities are consistent between the two different platforms. And we recently released um, our first large genome data set for SQL, which was Arabidopsis. And while I know Arabidopsis is not an insect, um, its genome size and complexity is similar to many of the insect genomes that you might be working with. So it's a good example of, um, of the scope of an insect genome project. So while we had sequenced 
Arabidopsis before using RS2 technology. This time we were able to sequence the 120 megabase genome at 90-fold coverage using only two smart cells. Um, our more uh, half of the um, raw data were contained in reads longer than 16 KB, and we only needed um, 0.25 micrograms of DNA per cell. And you can see here the um, assembly statistics for the genome assembly, and these are very uh, comparable to what we had achieved with RS2 data. So next I'm going to switch into the bioinformatics of large genome assembly, walking you through from raw reads to pre-assembled reads to genome assembly. With PacBio long reads, we use a hierarchical genome assembly process, or HGAP, which proceeds in two rounds. The first round of assembly involves the selection of seed reads, or the longest reads in the data set. All of the shorter reads are aligned to these long seed reads in order to generate consensus sequences with high accuracy. We refer to these high accuracy long reads as pre-assembled reads, or P reads, and they can be thought of as error corrected reads. In the next stage, the pre-assembled reads, or P reads, are aligned to each other in order to be assembled into contigs. One of the most exciting things happening at PacBio right now is the development of a diploid assembler Falcon Unzip. This was developed by Jason's Chin, Jason Chin's group here at PacBio, and um, his paper was recently accepted for publication in Nature Methods. There's also a preprint on BioArchive that you can look at. Um, diploid genome assembly is especially powerful for non-inbred or non-laboratory organisms. Um, heterozygosity may result in a highly fragmented genome assembly when using traditional methods. In contrast, Falcon Unzip can actually unzip the genome into phased haplotypes, resulting in better genome assemblies. So I'm going to walk you through the Falcon Unzip procedure. Um, Falcon Unzip picks up where the HGAP process left off. During the second HGAP step, where pre-assembled reads are aligned to each other to form contigs, there are sometimes bubbles that form in the underlying genome assembly graph in regions of the genome where there may be parental alleles that are highly divergent from each other due to structural variation, shown here in yellow or green. These bubbles in the assembly graph are initially resolved as a single longer primary contig shown in blue and multiple um, alternative contigs shown in red, which represent um, allelic variants. Um, this here represents the final stage of the Falcon assembler, which is a diploid aware assembler, but not a true diploid assembler because it does not actually phase the reads. Many researchers choose to conclude their assembly step here at the end of the Falcon stage. If you choose to move on to using Falcon Unzip, um, which is a true diploid assembler because it phases the reads, um, it, it refines the um, genome assembly by phasing the reads. So first, heterozygous sites are identified in the contig sequences, and then reads are phased and associated with a single haplotype based on their state at these pre-ascertained SNPs. Haplotypes may be extended along the assembly graph beyond bubble regions, as long as there is sufficient SNP density for reads to span at least two SNPs. Where parental alleles are very similar, only a single haplotype may be assembled. The final results for Falcon Unzip, again, consist of a single primary contig shown in blue with multiple alternative haplotigs in, shown in red, which re represent phased allelic variants. Some regions of the genome may be unzipped in this manner, and those are shown um, with these blue um, shaded boxes, um, where other regions of the genome may be resemble may be represented by only a single haplotype because the parental alleles are very similar or even identical. Following genome assembly, we do a round of what's called genome polishing. 
in order to increase the base quality of the sequence. All raw reads are mapped back to the reference sequence and consensus base calls and qualities are calculated using the quiver or arrow um, models, which are specifically developed for the observed error modes of smart sequencing. Here you can see a zoomed in region of the genome with the consensus sequence at top in color and all of the aligned raw reads below, one read per row. The base highlighted in green is called as a C in the consensus sequence, although a few of the raw reads have a deletion at that base. Now that I've outlined the PacBio workflow from sample prep through genome polishing, I'm going to spend the remainder of, of my time um, describing our PacBio assembly of the yellow fever mosquito Aedes aegypti. So we've been, in, we've been fortunate to be involved in a large collaborative effort led by Leslie Voschel and her postdoc Ben Matthews at the Rockefeller University. The 80s Genome Working Group includes dozens of academic researchers as well as several industry partners. The goal of the project is to improve the um, reference sequence for this mosquito in order to replace the current reference, which um, has frustrated researchers and stymied progress. Um, the 80s mosquito has been in the news a lot lately because it is the vector for the Zika virus, as well as yellow fever, dengue, and other tropical and semi-tropical diseases. The species actually consists of two subspecies, an ancestral form endemic to Africa and an anthropophilic form which has been globally dispersed by humans. The 80s genome <clears throat> Me, has a conserved dipterin karyotype with three metacentric chromosomes, including a pair of homomorphic sex chromosomes. The genome is large, 1.3 gigabases, which is nearly five times as long as the Anopheles gambii genome, the malaria mosquito. As you may expect due to its large size, the genome is highly repetitive, containing nearly 50% 50 50 transposable elements by length as well as abundant simple repeats and other classif unclassified repeats. The current reference sequence was first released in 2007 and was assembled with um, Sanger technology um, and uh, captured the um, inbred Liverpool strain. Uh, this assembly has been improved somewhat but remains um, highly fragmented and low quality. So here's the outline of, um, of uh, the process of making the PacBio um, 80s assembly that I'm going to go through in the next few slides. So in terms of the biological sample, um, Ben Matthews at Rockefeller University, from, he's from the Voschel Lab at Rockefeller, um, he was responsible for the preparation of the biological material for sequencing. Unfortunately, the original inbred Liverpool strain that was sequenced in 2007 has been lost, so he set out to create a quick inbred strain. He chose um, a single male and a single female from the non-inbred original Liverpool strain and subjected this pair to three rounds of inbreeding where he was actually able to use the founding male as the father for each of the three generations of inbreeding. This method turns out to be very effective at inbreeding given the time constraints, although it's possible that some regions of the genome may have as many as four allelic variants from the genomes of the founding pair. Um, ben extracted high molecular weight DNA from 80 male pupae in the fourth generation using a kit from Chiagen. Back at PacBio, Paul Peluso generated three large insert libraries of 20 to 30 KB to test several different conditions. Here we see an example of a 20 KB library size selected with blue pippin, and you can see that the smaller fragments of the library have been removed through the size selection. From these three libraries, we sequenced a total of 177 smart cells on the RS2 generating a total of 140 gigabases of sequence data, which gave us more than 100-fold coverage of the genome. Half of the raw reads were longer than, half of the raw data were contained in reads of 17, 17 KB or more, and we observed 
reeds that were upwards of 60 and even 80 kilobases long. It's important to note that the chip requirements for this project are quite high because it was done with the RS2 system and would be much lower if this um, data were collected on the SQL machine. We performed um, a Falcon unzip assembly on these data using P reads longer than 19 kilobases to assemble into contigs. We polished with the arrow consensus algorithm, and through an analysis of coverage and gene annotation, we identified additional haplotigs to obtain a final genome assembly whose statistics are shown here. The total length of the primary contigs are 1.45 gigabases with an additional half a gigabase of alternative haplotig sequence. Our assembly contains about 3,400 primary contigs, and half of the genome is contained in contigs longer than 1.43 megabases. Our longest contig is over 26 megabases. We also have more than 4,000 alternative haplotigs representing divergent allelic sequence. Um, and the N50 for the alternative haplotigs is 382 KB, with the longest alternative haplotig being more than 5 megabases long. In comparison to the Liverpool reference genome, which was done in 2007 and improved a little bit since then, um, we can see that our PacBio assembly is more complete, more contiguous, and of higher quality. The genome, the total lengths of the two assemblies are similar with the PacBio sequence being slightly longer. Um, we have a tenfold improvement in terms of the number of contigs. We have a 17-fold improvement in terms of the um, contiguity of the genome in terms of contig N50. We have more of the um, conserved eukaryotic sigma genes found in our assembly and fewer sigma genes with frame shift errors. I also want to compare our PAC bioassembly to an uh, assembly that was done by a group in Berkeley in 2015. And this was a short read assembly um, done with a small insert paired end library. And while this genome was never intended to serve as a reference for the mosquito community, it's an example of um, what you might get from a short read insect assembly. You can see that their assembly is very incomplete. It has only about half of the total length of the PacBio assembly. Um, in terms of the number of contigs, it's um, very poor. The contig N50 is only one kilobase. Um, and it's missing about a third of the sigma genes and has more genes with frame shift errors. So I want to give you a sense of the phasing that is achieved in our pack bio assembly of the 80s mosquito. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you um, two examples of primary contigs and their associated haplotigs. Here is, is a real example of a one megabase region of the 80s genome that contains three divergent haplotigs shown in red. We are, we're able to align each of these haplotigs back to the primary contig using a program such as Moomer and, and can visualize these alignments with a dot plot, which shows the degree of collinearity and structural difference between the haplotigs and the primary contigs. You can see that haplotig 1 is largely collinear with the primary contig, whereas haplotigs 2 and 3 have deletions relative to the primary contig, as well as regions of non-unique alignment shown in red. Haplotig 1 represents a phased haplotype outside of one of those bubble regions in the assembly graph, um, which typically contains structural variation. And this indicates that with um, Falcon Unzip Assembler, we're able to resolve haplotypes and phase haplotypes into regions of the genome that may have lower levels of divergence between the starting chromosomes. Here's another example of um, phasing of haplotypes that extends over four megabases. When we align, um, when we align this haplotig to its primary contig, we observe that only about 25% of the sequence is aligned because these two haplotypes are so divergent from each other. However, we know that these are allelic haplotypes due to the fact that they share more than 60 genes 
eight of which are single copy conserved arthropod genes from the Busco set. Zooming in, um, here is an example of a sodium ion channel gene that was recently shown to be involved in the evolution of resistance to DDT and pyrethroid insecticides. By blasting the transcript of this gene, we're able to find the gene in our PacBio assembly, the Liverpool reference genome, as well as the draft Illumina assembly from 2015. Only the PacBio contig, contigs were able to completely resolve the full length of the gene, which spans more than 500 kilobases. The PacBio contig sequence contains a full length, over 2,100 amino acid protein transcript, um, whereas 11% of the protein length is missing from the N terminal in the Liverpool assembly, and more than 84% of the N terminal is missing in the Illumina assembly. This sodium ion channel gene illustrates an important difference between contigs and scaffolds. Many assembly methods based on paired end short read data can produce impressive scaffold lengths and scaffold N50s that are of comparable magnitude to the contig N50 of PacBio assemblies. However, it's important to note that these scaffolds contain regions of unresolved sequence or runs of ends whose precise length is often not known or worse, incorrectly estimated. This can result in missing or erroneous information and obvious gaps in our knowledge of genic and intergenic sequence and their inferred function. PacBio contigs are completely contiguous and fully resolved genomic sequence with no gaps. If you're interested in reading more about this, we have a blog post linked here at the bottom of the slide. So with that, I want to summarize um, some of the advantages of diploid assembly with PacBio data for insect genomics. Um, with this workflow I've described, we're able to more accurately um, assemble non-model and non-laboratory organisms. These organisms may be non-inbred, they may be heterozygous, and they may even include pooled individuals, multiple individuals in a single um, sequencing project. Um, with PacBio assembly and Falcon Unzip, we're able to accomplish phasing of long-range allelic haplotypes. We have more complete base pair resolution of the genome higher genome contiguity and completeness. And as an added bonus, we can even estimate um, variation between the parental chromosomes that go into the sample, looking at spatial patterns of variation across the genome and even copy number or structural variation between the starting um, alleles in the sample. So for the last few slides, I want to just um, uh, note a few of the genome annotation tools that PacBio has and a couple of the uh, visualization tools that have been um, developed. Um, the ISOSeq method performs, is, is our transcript assembly uh, workflow, and it performs de novo assembly of full-length transcripts. It can assemble both longer transcripts and more numerous isoforms than short read technologies. Um, as an evolutionary biologist, um, I find this paper to be incredibly interesting. Um, a recent paper used PacBio sequencing in the peppered moth, the classic um, color morph case, um, and identified a, a transposable element insertion into the cortex gene, which is responsible for this classic um, carbonaria morph. PacBio data can also be used to detect epigenetic markers, such as base methylation, using polymerase kinetics. When a methylated or otherwise, otherwise modified base is encountered during sequencing, a delay in the base incorporation is observed, shown here in the top right. Researchers can easily scan the entire genome for base modifications and characterize how these relate to gene expression, host pathogen interaction, DNA damage repair, and DNA sequence motifs, as shown here in this um, figure from a paper about C. elegans. In terms of data visualization, um, I want to um, make a plug for some work that Aaron Wenger at PacBio has done. He's made some modifications to the popular IGV browser, which make visualizing PacBio reads a lot easier. Um, here I'm showing the phasing of two human haplotypes using um, an added feature called quick phasing, where you can sort 
your um, reads based on their state at a particular SNP. Um, he's also added this feature where um, large inserted blocks of sequence can be summarized as purple um, boxes for, um, for better visualization. And you can go ahead and download this TACBio friendly version of IGV through the Broad website with the link that I've included here. And finally, um, I want to highlight some work done by Maria Nettestead, who is a um, graduate student with Mike Schatz at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. Um, she's developed a tool called Ribbon, which allows you to look at structural variation using individual PacBio reads. You can load a BAM file into um, Ribbon and look at how reads map to different parts of the genome. So here's an example in humans of a 10 KB read that maps to both chromosome 16 and chromosome 19. And so you can see that this region in the middle of the read that maps to chromosome 19 probably originated as an insertion of sequence from chromosome 19 into chromosome 16. So with that, um, Jonas and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Jonas. Um, I want to make one comment quickly. Uh, it looks like I got autocorrected at just the wrong time. So if anybody is looking to send their questions via email to me, my email is Anna period Childers at ars.usda.gov. And so the name is spelled as it is in the top of the participants list. Uh, unfortunately, when I sent it out earlier, uh, the, uh, the, the things decided to autocorrect and, and remove the L there. So, so that is one way to send me questions. The other way, again, is to just send them uh, via a private message just by clicking on my name. And so I think I'll, I'll start with the questions now. And so I think we can turn the video back on for uh, Jonas and Sarah and I. Um, but so what, one of the questions we've got is what a DNA volume is necessary for the current chemistry uh, versus uh, the RS2 and other chemistries? And um, I believe I was just at a smart developers conference, and I believe you all are doing um, some work on that. And, and that the newest chemistries that will be coming out are going to require even less DNA. But I'll, I'll let you guys uh, answer that question. Yeah, that's right. Maybe I'll start and then Sarah can weigh in if I forgot anything. That, that's right. And so uh, currently we have um, just announced some improvements which bring the uh, input requirements to the same level as they were on the, uh, on the RS2. And so um, uh, you need about on the order of um, 100 picomolar or so on plate concentrations. And as Sarah said, this corresponds to um, between 25 to 250 nanograms uh, per smart cell, typically the users start with 10 micrograms of DNA to make one library and then have enough uh, DNA for all the smart cells that are being run for the entire uh, genome project. We do have some um, protocols for uh, cases where 10 micrograms is not available, and uh, those protocols um, for making long insert library uh, DNA go down to maybe half or, or one microgram if, if um, not sufficient material is available. And then uh, typical library yield, I think, uh, Sarah, is about 25, 30 percent, uh, which is then available for the, for the sequencing. I think you covered it. I don't have anything to add. OK, wonderful. Um, next question would be, can Falcon Unzip support hybrid data? Uh, what's the suggested coverage for PacBio only data using that uh, software platform? Right. Um, we typically recommend 40 to 60x coverage at the minimal for a um, Falcon Unzip assembly. Um, in terms of hybrid data, People are, are actively using Falcon Unzip to assemble um, hybrid plants, walnut trees, things like that. Um, it's a little bit experimental um, because Falcon Unzip is designed as a diploid assembler. Um, so some people are using it for polyploid assemblies. We've used it for um, hexaploid wheat. 
Um, so it's an area of active research, but um, in fact, if you have, if you, the more divergent the um, parental alleles are going into that hybrid, it actually makes it easier to more accurately assemble. Um, it's sort of when you have uh, intermediate or even low levels of divergence between the parental alleles that it can be difficult to accurately assemble those haplotypes correctly. So as long as you can get a sample of hybrids who all each have the identical genotype to each other, so you have enough starting material, I don't expect that that would be a problem for a falcon unzip. Okay, I, and I think what they may have, that's a, actually a great, that answers another question oh. that was coming up, but I think the, I, the question about hybrid data may have also been in reference to uh, Illumina uh, data, right. which would, that would be right. used in the polishing step, correct, and, and not uh, sure, that, yeah, I was thinking of a, of a biological hybrid. Um, in terms of hybrid data, um, so with Falcon Unzip, you could actually feed into it either raw reads, and then it does the round of error correction with mapping the short reads to the seed reads, or you can feed it pre-assembled reads, which could be error corrected reads. Um, I'm personally not familiar with the programs that people use to map short read Illumina data to pack bio reads in order to um, obtain error corrected reads. But once you have those error corrected reads, you should be able to feed them into Falcon Unzip and do the assembly from that type of data. Okay, and, and so presumably that may also allow some of you out there that are using software that allows you to create mega reads from Illumina, um, you may be able to look into that technology. Uh, basically, it, it's, it's sort of an initial assembly of Illumina, I believe, but that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a separate, separate issue. Um, let me right. see. One so thing. we have two Can questions I? regarding... Yes, go ahead, Janice. Sorry, yes. Um, so I, I just wanted to, so we've seen uh, some of the researchers have compared tech bio only assemblies and hybrid assemblies. And uh, one thing that's worth noting is that because of the bias with regard to GC content and low complexity sequences um, and mapping issues in uh, repetitive regions with the short reads, the error correction in the hybrid model where you use the Illumina reads uh, to error correct the tech bio reads uh, will be much less uh, complete uh, and much less uh, comprehensive. And so what happens then is that you have patches of the PEC bio reads being corrected with the Illumina reads, but then there will be regions where there are no Illumina reads or low quality Illumina reads. And that's where things uh, will break. And that's the reason why I think pretty uh, universally uh, the researchers have found that the quality of the resulting assembly in the hybrid mode is uh, significantly less than uh, doing a PEC bio only assembly where you use the the reads with the same, the pack bio reads with the same underlying characteristics to correct the longest uh, seed reads. What we have seen, I think, that's been uh, relatively uh, successful and that's been applied quite a lot as a, an orthogonal uh, step for the polishing, uh, or sort of even after the polishing, people have used Illumina reads for py with pylon and um, uh, you know, sort of to have an orthogonal data set to look at the overall consensus accuracy. But uh, in all the examples that I've seen, the hybrid assemblies were of less contiguity and quality than the pack by only assemblies. Um, let me just add in terms of um, the, uh, if you're going to do a hybrid assembly, what depth of coverage to use for pack bio. Um, we recommend at least 30x coverage um, going into the post P read um, overlap stage of the assembly. Um, and you could also, if people are interested in um, this in more detail, if you go to the GitHub page for Falcon Unzip, there's a really active um, discussion board on there. So there's, that's a, a good resource for people who have other questions. Wonderful. Um, okay, we have two questions regarding access to SQL machines. One is where can people get access to the machines in Europe, and then also uh, core facilities that have the SQL operating uh, presumably anywhere, and the, what would be the comparable sequence length and quality with respect to the RS2 machines? So I'll take the first question. So. Um, you know, um, I would say, so there are quite a number of SQL machines uh, out there now, and, and uh, uh, you know, it is uh, still a bit new, but uh, people are, are getting run and, and qualified and are starting to provide service. And so 
we'd be happy to uh, facilitate um, uh, any interest in SQL uh, service providers. Um, so I think, you know, it may not be um, uh, um, appropriate to go through sort of detail in this kind of format. So if you can contact us um, and uh, either through the website or email us directly, um, then uh, we can we can uh, connect you with the relevant um, local uh, support teams in Europe or uh, North America or Asia or anywhere in the world and point you to suitable uh, service providers. And I forgot the second question. What, what is that? Was read length and quality on SQL okay. versus RS2? Yeah. Um, so like like Sarah said, they're comparable um, uh, with regard to the read length for these um, uh, long insert libraries and uh, um, you know so sort of on the order of and the example that uh, uh, Sarah showed is um, uh, you know representative and uh, the N50 read length meaning half of the reads are in read length greater than that number is currently around 15 KB um, on the SQL unit. Wonderful. Um, here we'll dive into a biological question. Uh, Sarah, when you were presenting the information about the mosquito assembly, did you figure out what the additional sequence in the mosquito pack bio assembly was compared to the original Sanger assembly? Um, was it repeat structural variation, missing genes? Do you, do you happen to know what that was? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we actually think that these are um, divergent haplotigs that haven't been kind of matched up with their homologous contig. And so this is kind of an ongoing effort. Um, I mentioned that we have looked at coverage across the genome as well as gene annotations in order to kind of uh, zip back together the resolved and phased haplotypes into homologous genomic regions. Um, in terms of the way we did that, it was based on BUSCO gene annotations, which is about a set of about 2,500 conserved arthropod genes. Obviously, some contexts don't have BUSCO genes, so we're going to have to go back and look for um, contexts that might have half the coverage that would be expected, and then that would allow us to recategorize these as haplotigs. But having said that, I mean, in addition to that effect, you know, Sarah gave one example where there was uh, a new portion of a gene that was previously missing with the sodium channel, so and, and there are no gaps in that assembly, so we uh, expect um, that a number of gaps will be filled, which will be uh, additional information as well as uh, repetitive sequence, paracentromeric, uh, telomeric sequence, so forth, um, would be in the assembly. I would say that we haven't done an exhaustive search on that, uh, right, Sarah? Mm -hmm. That's right. And some of the work that Jonas mentioned from um, Amanda Laracuente's lab at the University of Rochester, she's been able to sequence very, very deep into um, heterochromatic regions of the genome through centromeres and kind of characterize incredibly repetitive sequence um, using TACBio data. And in order to do that, she's had to use slightly different assembly parameters than you might use to assemble the majority of the kind of genic portion of the genome. Um, but, um, you know, I think we're able to delve into the kind of darker regions of the genome with tac bio sequence, and we just haven't been able to do that with other technologies. Yeah, that's a really great point. Uh, Amanda gave a great talk uh, about two or three weeks ago at the West Coast User Group meeting. And her slides are available uh, through our blog post. So if you go to pacb.com, uh, there's a blog, and uh, we have a blog post uh, report on the user group meeting. And her excellent presentation uh, slides are on there if you're interested uh, in more of that exciting research. Great. And I think this is sort of related. Um, when you're using pac sequencing, how does it reconstruct tandem repeats, both with short and long repeat units? Um, as long as the read, as long as the read is longer than, um, oh, it depends on how long the array is. Um, it, it's really kind of a, it depends on the size of the repeat and the size of um, the tandem array. Uh, that this is an area where coverage can be used in order to kind of make some improvements in the assembly through a tandem array of repeats, um, but. 
you know, even with long reads like we have, there's still the kind of theoretical limits of, of being able to assemble through identical tandemly arrayed repeats. I don't know if you want to say anything else about that, Jonas? Maybe a little bit and, and being mindful of the fact that I'm not a bioinformatician, so you get the layman's version of, uh, of this. So um, my understanding is that as long as the, the tandem repeat is uh, shorter than the overall tech bio continuous read length of um, you know, 50 or 60,000 bases, they will be fully contained and, and you have unique anchors and that will resolve them fully. Uh, when they get longer than that, uh, then you can still take advantage of um, individual base differences in the repeat units. So if the repeats are not um, perfect repeats, then you can use that uh, divergence to basically walk yourself through that tandem repeat. It does get tougher uh, if you have, you know, a uh, 100, 200 KB uh, repeat to resolve that just through the assembly. And for that, um, researchers have used um, uh, orthogonal and complementary techniques such as bio-nano uh, genomics mapping. We recently announced that we have a, an agreement and a partnership with Dovetail Genomics, and you can use some of those scaffolding uh, technologies to further get, and in some cases that's been described, chromosome level um, contiguity with regard to scaffolds and, and get yourself through um, those regions and resolve them. All right, and I have a couple more questions, but one thing first, uh, Sarah, we have the uh, OrthoDB group online here, and they said they are working on a diptera set with many more Buscos, so hopefully that will be able to help you all out. So I'll put you two in touch. But um, uh, one uh, other question we have uh, from the, the group is that often scientists have to deal with a lot of trade-offs between DNA quality and the number of individuals that they have to sequence um, as a pre proxy for heterozygosity. Um, are there particular cutoffs that you can recommend for either, um, either of the PEC biotechnologies? And so, for example, if you can get, uh, uh, you know, 0.1 micrograms out of a single individual, should you only use one or should you sequence multiple uh, individuals, or, or are, are things simply just more complicated than that and you, you can't have a simple uh, uh, workflow there? Yeah, there, there does, um, the complication would be if you're able to uh, generate multiple individuals and pool them and they all have the same genotype, so say you have two divergent um, parental strains and you cross them together and all of the F1 hybrids are exactly genetically identi identical, that would be fine to pool them. Um, I think the difficulty comes in when you have recombination happening between divergent haplotypes and different breakpoints in different individuals. That becomes kind of a mess in terms of um, assembling that. Um, so again, it depends on how, you know, how heterozygous your organism is, how big it is, um, and that's something that I'd be happy to discuss with somebody offline about the kind of particulars of their system. Okay. Wonderful. And yeah, I that's think right. And you know, so I, I agree with, with Sarah, uh, and maybe just one small uh, addition that, you know, if you are constrained and if you really have a meta genome population of, of uh, individuals, I would argue that even though the assembly may not be as uh, neat and, and clean as we've seen in some of these cases here, uh, the long continuous reads still give you a lot of information about the uh, heterozygosity and the uh, structural genetic diversity of that population. Um, more so, I would argue, much more so, I would argue, than the, the short reads. Wonderful. And so I, I suspect there are other questions, but I know that we're also coming to the top of the hour. So I um, want to thank our speakers again. And, and if there are other questions, uh, if people want to email those to me, I'd be happy to put you in touch um, with our speakers. And so with that, again, I, I thank you, Sarah and Jonas, for your time and all of your effort to, to put this seminar and this webinar together for us. And uh, so with that, I think we'll thank you and look forward to next week. We'll have 10X Genomics presenting. And if anyone has, wants to look at the schedule, that's up on our I5K webinar website. So thank you again.
And thank you, Anna. Thank you so much.